Welcome to lecture 42. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about how to calculate the structure of compact stars in general relativity. Recall that in lecture 41, we derived the structure equations for statically, static and spherically symmetric stars in general relativity. These equations are known as the TOV equations. In this lecture, we will go on to solve the TOV equations for compact stars, such as neutron stars. Jumping right in, those are the equations that um, are governing the structure of stars in general relativity, listed here in equation 42.1, and they are the TOV equations that we derived in, in the last lecture. As a, a reminder, m of r here, this function that is derived here for this first equation, is um, the mass within the sphere of radius r for a spherical symmetric star. And energy density is denoted by epsilon, and the pressure is denoted by p. There are two equations for three unknowns, epsilon, p, and m. So we need another equation to close the system. And that equation has to be a property of the star itself. So that has to be a property of the matter that the star is made of. This equation of state comes in the form p is p of epsilon and uh, can be used to then close the system and get a solution for the structure of a star in general relativity. For many substances, the equation of state is readily calculated. An example for this would be gases, where you can take the Boltzmann equation, for instance, to calculate the equation of state. Um, there are others that are more tricky to calculate, uh, in particular for the strong interactions governed by QCD. This, for instance, requires supercomputers if you want to get the equation of state for high temperature QCD. Um, and there are other instances where there is no known first principle to calculate the equation of state accurately. Neutron stars precisely fall in this category. The uh, theory that describes nuclear matter, which is the uh, property of, of neutron stars, is given by QCD. But this region of QCD is plagued by what's known as the sign problem, preventing effectively the supercomputer techniques that are very um, effective in solving the equation of state at high temperature. What one can do, however, is one can do first principle calculations in some regimes. Um, namely, one can calculate at very high density and at very low density from first principles, and then just stop where you sort of lose control over your calculation and do an interpolation in the middle. As an example of how uh, this looks like, I have a plot here for the equation of state of nuclear matter. What was done here was a first principle calculation with very high density, which is here to the left, very high energy density and pressure, and a first principle calculation um, at very low density. Um, and then in, in between these two cases, essentially these two equations of state were just matched to each other um, in the thermodynamically consistent manner. So uh, performing this calculation, one indeed finds um, results for the equation of state that is well behaved throughout the whole region and is semi-realistic in the sense that it includes all the necessary uh, properties and gives uh, sort of results that are consistent with observation of neutron stars. However, these calculations of the equation of state are far beyond what we want to talk about in this course. So for the purpose of the lecture course, we want to take a toy model for the equation of state. This toy model is known as the VAC model. And using it, we will not be describing actual neutron stars. But at, at best, we will be describing hypothetical stars that are pure quark matter, so pure quark stars um, that sort of have been conjectured to exist um, and nevertheless sort of show us how to sort of uh, go about calculating the structure of stars using some real world features of QCD. So for the back model equation of state, what one has is that the pressure P is equal to a function of the chemical potential mu. And it's given as this function here. So there's a term here that is mu to the fourth with a constant and the term V to the four, where um, V here is a constant. It's known as the back constant. And from this pressure given in this form, one can use the standard thermodynamic relations, two of which I've listed here, to calculate um, the energy density epsilon. 
In particular, what you need to use is you need to know that the density is given as the first derivative of the pressure with respect to the chemical potential, and then that the energy density at zero temperature is given as the chemical potential times the density minus the pressure. So once you sort of know the functional form of the pressure, you can calculate the energy density. And if you have the energy density into pressure, you can calculate the equation of state. The back constant here is a model component. It cannot be calculated from first principle. It is something that you basically have to uh, put in by hand. And uh, one can nevertheless make an educated guess about what would be a reasonable value for this constant. And that is to simply say, oh, we want to describe nuclear matter Nuclear matter is described by QCD, and QCD has a fundamental scale on the order of uh, about 200 MeV mega electron volt. So B uh, can be taken to be about 0 0.2 giga electron volt GeV for short. This then completes the equation of state and uh, plugging these in and sort of doing this uh, manipulation to get the energy density. The equation of state for the back model equation of state, the back model equation of state becomes P is epsilon over three minus a constant. So this is actually an important feature. Um, the uh, pressure for the back model equation of state um, becomes zero if the energy density is uh, small enough such that the right-hand side just uh, cancels between the energy density and the back constant. And this happens for a finite energy density, um, minimum energy density, which is given as four times the B constant to the fourth power. Um, this is important because it actually sort of matches a feature that we have for nuclear matter. Um, they are also the energy density, the minimum energy density basically um, is, is given by a finite value. And the finite value numerically kind of agrees with this value here. It's about one baryon per cubic femtometer. This is also the result that we get if you plug in this value for the back constant from the last slide. Now, if um, we have such a thing, then we uh, can use this, for instance, to define the edge of the star by requiring that the pressure at some radius r is equal to zero. Um, that sort of defines the surface of the star. Anything but the pressure is positive is still part of the star. Everything but the pressure is, uh, if the pressure um, outside of the star will basically be zero, so that's basically considered the vacuum. So by this definition here, the surface of the star is located at R is equal to capital R. So once we have an equation of state, we know that our systems of equations, the TOV equations are complete, and we can go and solve the TOV equations. It turns out that for most situations, most equations of state, it's actually not possible to obtain analytic solutions for TOV equations. However, one can readily solve this in a numerical fashion. How does one do this? One starts by going back to the equations 42.1 and discretizes derivatives as finite differences. For instance, where we have a derivative of the mass function, we write it as the mass function at a slight displacement in radius minus the same divided by the displacement. That is just a discretized version of the derivative. Then on the right hand side, um, we have uh, four pi r squared that gets discretized to, um, so the r gets discretized to r plus delta r over two. The two squared cancels the four. So basically this is the right hand side here. And if we wanted to do, we can sort of go ahead and uh, program an implicit solver where the energy density also is evaluated at midpoint rather than um, this, the, the point to the left. The main point is now that if we start at the star center, r is zero, where the mass is also zero. And we pick a value for the pressure in the center of the star, the central pressure P naught. And we also pick a discretization delta R. Then this discretized version of this equation can be solved together with the other discretized equation for the energy density to calculate uh, the pressure now at uh, location delta R and the mass at delta R. Once we have those, we can iterate this equation here and calculate the pressure and the mass at a location two delta R and so on until we reach a point where the pressure that we calculate is zero, which we define as the edge of the star. Of course, um, there is some, well, there is some picking involved. One of them is the picking the central star's pressure. Uh, this basically has some physical meaning. 
there's also an unphysical picking involved, namely for the discretization delta r. And of course, if one does this, one has to make sure that whatever choice for delta r is picked, the end result does not depend on the choice. So typically what one has to do is one has to show that at least for two values of the discretization delta r, beta three, the results that you get for the radius of the star and the mass of the star are unchanged. So basically unchanged uh, within some, some small changes. So I said that the choice for the center pressure of the star P0 is a physical choice. Um, that's because for, the, uh, for every value of P0, there's a unique star radius R and a corresponding stellar mass M of R. One can, of course, repeat the calculation and choose a different value of P0. So one gets a family of solutions for the star's radius and mass. This is known as a mass radius or MR relation. For the back model, the equation of state that I just outlined in the previous slides, it looks like this, uh, using a discretized solver as uh, outlined in the previous slide. So if I express the mass that we get for the star in units of the solar mass and the radius in terms of kilometers, each one of these points corresponds to a different choice for P0. And when we find that as one increases P0, the mass and the radius both increase. They increase until they reach a maximum mass. And then the um, mass decreases. The radius already has to start to decrease beforehand. So from this MR relation, one can read off the maximum star, the maximum mass of stars with a given equation of state. So looking back here, there is one maximum mass for this particular equation of state uh, that can come out of that. For the back model equation of state, this maximum mass is given by about 1.5, 1.05 solar masses. If one increases P0 above, the one that gave us the maximum mass, the star's mass starts to decrease again. However, these hypothetical stars, where the um, star's mass decreases um, below and max, are actually unstable against perturbations and they'll collapse, as will be uh, argued um, in, the, in a few slides from now. The upshot is that these stable star configurations terminate once the maximum mass is, is reached. The argument why the um, branch of the mass radius relationship that goes beyond a max is unstable is uh, basically following Chandrasekhar's argument. The argument doesn't rely on general relativity, so we'll just use a Newtonian version of this. So basically, the uh, equation that we'll need is the total energy balance for the star. This total energy for the star has two contributions. There's the matter contribution, the stuff that's making up the star, and there's the gravitational potential energy that the star um, has because it's self-gravitating. In the following, um, the types of stars that I'll be considering are stars that are uh, made up of baryons of mass m. The baryons, think of baryons as being either protons or neutrons. So the total mass of the star is then given as the number n of these baryons times the baryon mass. The gravitational potential energy will be minus gm times m, where m is again the same baryon, over r, the radius of the star. So if you plug in m here, we find that the gravitational potential energy is minus g times n, the number of baryons, times m squared over r. Next, consider the matter part. The matter contribution is equal to the chemical potential. This is the also known as Fermi energy in low energy physics. The um, chemical potential mu, if you go back to our slides for the equation of state, is related to the density n as the third power because the density n is given as the third power of uh, the chemical potential. And the density of uh, the matter is given as the number divided by the radius. So we find that the matter um, contribution to the energy budget is the number to the one third power divided by the radius. Putting everything together, we find that the total energy for the star is given as n to the power of one third over r minus gn times m squared over r. 
if we have a star and we then add a baryon to the star, this will change the total energy. The change in the total energy will be given by the derivative of this um, with respect to n. So doing the differential of this with respect to n, we find that the total energy is given as one third times n to the minus two thirds minus g m squared and the whole thing times the change in the number divided by alpha. So that's the equation that we use to argue about the stability of stars. Let's first concentrate on the case where there are very few particles making up the star. If n is very small, then n to the minus something is very large. And this term will dominate over the gm squared term here, such that the total change in the energy is positive. So as long as n is very small, adding a particle will increase the uh, energy of the star, and uh, this will result in a stable star configuration. However, the opposite limit is when n is very, very big, because then n to a negative number is very small. So this term will lose over the term gm squared, and the total change in the energy will be less than zero. So the total, so the total energy uh, will decrease if one adds a baryon. This is a runaway process. So as you add on Murray baryons, the energy will decrease and decrease and decrease until basically you have a runaway process and the star basically sort of, it, its energy sort of goes to minus infinity. And essentially what you have is a runaway process that um, says that the star is collapsing into a black hole. The maximum mass is precisely the limit between these two stability regions. And that's given where basically these two terms are equal to each other. We find that this maximum mass is allowed, the maximum allowed mass is found when n is equal to n max, which is proportional to one over g m squared to the power of three halves. And from this one finds that the maximum mass of the star is given as the maximum number of variants in the star times the variant mass, which then is given as n to the minus two times h plus c over g to the power of three halves, where I have just restored uh, usual units by uh, converting um, natural units into standard units. One can evaluate this expression, um, and this expression is giving us the maximum mass for the stars, and this maximum mass of the stars is known as the gender C limit. This uh, limit depends only on the mass of the baryon, so it's the same for different types of stars. In particular for white dwarfs, one finds that there is a maximum mass on the order of one solar mass, even though white dwarfs have a radius of about 5,000 kilometers. And for neutron stars, the, one finds the same maximum mass on the order of one solar mass with where the radius is now only uh, order 10 kilometers. That's because both white dwarfs and neutron stars, both of these stars are mostly made up in terms of uh, baryons. And uh, it is that that sort of controls the maximum mass for these stars. So to reiterate, the chandler shaker limit is the maximum mass um, that a star can have in uh, general relativity. If you go beyond this maximum mass limit, the star will collapse into a black hole. And uh, one can estimate the Chandrasekhar mass from these uh, arguments that I've given. Uh, one can also, if one actually knows the um, equation of state for the star, calculate the maximum mass for this particular concept, um, including all the numbers as we've done with our model equation of state. And this concludes the first lecture.